Hey everyone, Jeff here, also known as the Revit Kid. Welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. I've got a great guest, uh, repeat uh, guest on the show, Dan Stein. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, remember him. If not, uh, I'll definitely link to previous posts. But he's here today to talk about Enscape 3.0 and a few other great things um, for those of you who, who have been following along with, with Dan's other other uh, um, uh, appearances on the show. Um, he transitioned to, to two di uh, different company, to Lake Flato um, Architects down in Texas uh, throughout the process of being on the show. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that personally, because I love Lake Flato as a design firm, but also I'm interested in, in the transition and technology and how all that works. So uh, stay tuned for that. And I know Dan always has some really cool um, gems and secrets, especially when it comes to Enscape and whatever he's showing. So make sure you stick around uh, for the for the demonstration and what we're talking about with Enscape. Before we jump into the content, I did want to um, recognize and thank BIMBOX for sponsoring this episode. Uh, for the past six months or so, they've been sponsoring every episode. So thank you, BIMBOX. For those of you not familiar with what BIMBOX is, uh, they are a PC uh, manufacturer for the AEC industry. So they make desktops and laptops specifically for us. And not just AEC industry, but also specifically for Revit. Um, and so uh, their laptops and desktops have been designed and optimized for the use with Revit, believe it or not. So when someone asks you, hey, what's a good Revit PC? You've got an answer now. Um, a couple things to know about BIMBOX, as I pull up the little uh, little key here, is um, they will uh, they have three-year warranty on all of their, all of their um, uh, desktops and laptops. Uh, they will ship and deliver within 10 to 14 days. And they do have a lot of components in stock. Anyone who's tried to buy a laptop or a desktop right now, um, you may have gone through this where you're either compromising on maybe what your hardware is because of what's in stock, or you literally can't get it because certain things are in stock. So I can guarantee you that um, BIMBOX has uh, Series 3000 graphics cards in stock, RAM in stock, whatever you need in stock, which is awesome. So head on over to bimbox.bimafterdark.com or email sales at bimboxusa.com. Let them know that you heard about it here and thank them for sponsoring this show. So thank you so much. So without further ado, let's introduce my guest, Dan Stein. Daniel, what's up, man? <laughs> Welcome back to the show. <clears throat> Let me make sure. Let me make sure uh, your audio was. I had you muted again. I don't know why I always mute. I <laughs> guess before. I think it's like a default on OBS. <laughs> but uh, all, he, all he said was hi. You guys didn't miss anything yeah, important. Yeah. <laughs> the sign of the times. You're yeah. on mute. Yeah, I know, right? And this <laughs> time, this time you weren't on mute, but I had you muted broadcasting to the world. So. Yeah. Uh, so welcome, Dan. Thank you for coming back on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, Dan, yeah. you've you've been here. Uh, this is the third time, I think, now. Um, which is pretty cool over the last year. Uh, and I think every time we kind of talked about Enscape. So when I was trying to plan an Enscape 3.0 show, I had to reach out to you to see what was going on. Uh, so uh, here you are, here we are. And uh, I did want to remind everyone in the chat that uh, if you're here right now today, Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, um, you're live. And feel free to ask us questions, chat. I'm going to be following along as we go as we go through the conversation. So Dan, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and... Um, why don't you let everyone know who maybe didn't see the previous episodes, uh, who you are and uh, and what you're up to. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Dan Stein. I'm the director of design technology at Lake Plato Architects in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I also teach graduate architecture students at NDSU and been, been doing that for about seven years now. Uh, I've written 14 textbooks. Six of them are on Revit. One of those Revit books is the number one Revit book in North America in the academic market. Um, two of the books are on architectural sketching, interestingly enough, and another two are study guides for Microsoft certifications, one for Excel and one that's um, at the publisher but not available yet on Word. I have a blog, BIM Chapters, that gets 30 to 40,000 views a month and write blog posts for Enscape. So I got a great relationship with Enscape going all the way back to 2015 when they first came out. <laughs> and I think that's that's the quick version. Awesome. <laughs> and I will I will put links to all of the things that Dan mentioned in the in the repost or in the description below. Um, definitely check out BIM chapters and, uh, and all of Dan's books. I think we gave away a couple books on uh, one of the last times you came out, which was pretty cool. So I appreciate that. Um, so sure. before before we get into Enscape, um, you know, I think 
the last time you were on, you were sort of fresh and new uh, at Lake Flato. And I think now you've been there for a little while. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to uh, to get a little bit of a take on on how that's going. And also from the since this is, you know, BIM after dark and, you know, we're, we're sort of a BIM adjacent show, um, you know, uh, how technology sort of um, how they're using it, how how the transitions going, how you're seeing it being used um, from from a personal standpoint. And I think I mentioned this in the description or at least maybe in an email to everyone. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> uh, Lake Flato um, is probably one of my top three design firms, especially on the residential side. And I, I know that they do much more than residential. But um, um, and so, you know, I'm personally interested in sort of how how this little thing called Revit and BIM plays into uh, literally these these books that I have flagged and bookmarked as inspiration for like any time I'm doing a design. So uh, maybe maybe give everyone sort of a little feeling of what that transition was like, what how you're seeing this sort of, uh, um, you know, world renowned, uh, you know, award winning design firm is utilizing this technology that we always talk about. Yeah, and if you recall, when I was on your show, I was it was the first time I was actually able to announce that yes. what, where my new position was. Groundbreaking. Uh, I should have like a and, breaking and, news thing, that graphic that I pull up when yeah, people announce Yeah, in fact, that, that was like, <laughs> yep. And, and in fact, that was even like two days before all of the staff at Lake Flato heard about my <laughs> my coming on board because I was, I was uh uh, basically, I occupy a, a new position that didn't previously exist. Hmm. But yeah, back up for just a minute, just a little bit more about Lake Flato, I suppose. Um, hmm. Architect Magazine hmm. at the end of 2019 named it the number one ranked architecture firm in the U.S. in their uh, architect top 50 list. Um, and then I, I suppose because of the pandemic, it I haven't seen a new ranking. So as far as I'm concerned, we're still number one. <laughs> <laughs> They're delaying the ranking. Another to interesting hold it on, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, the, the firm does uh, quite a bit of residential, but there's also um, probably a little bit more than half the firm that works on commercial projects. And uh, we've won more of the AIA COAT awards. So the AIA's top award for sustainability than any other firm in the US. Mm -hmm. We've won 13 of those and two of those were in, in uh, 2020. And uh, one of them was for the Austin Central Library. And another one was for a Marine Research Center for the Southern Mississippi University. Um, Let's see. And as you mentioned, there's several books available that a person can buy on Amazon. And mm -hmm. one actually just came out um, just since I've, I've been with the firm. And it's the first book that really features uh, our commercial projects. All mm -hmm. the previous books are mostly on residential. Mm -hmm. um, and there's actually a new residential book that's that's done and to the publisher that will be coming out in the near future. Nice. Uh, just uh, a <laughs> week and a half ago, uh, Ted Flato and, and Bob Harris, par uh, partners from our office, were on on a um, San Antonio Book Festival mm. virtual presentation and Q and A about the book, which was really cool. But um, it, you can see my camera, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this is the new commercial book, and the cover image is the Austin Central Library and. There's some really cool images inside the book. I, mm -hmm. I flagged a couple of them here just to show off about the firm. It's a really cool rooftop mm -hmm. patio. Mm -hmm. Lots of information in here on sustainable design metrics. There's this large urban reuse that we did a master plan for in San Antonio called the Pearl. It's just a, an amazing place to go hang out. And there's mixed use of so retail and apartments and hotel and restaurants and coffee shops. Um, so let's see, what else? Yeah, so the the role that I occupied, and can you see my screen yet or just me? Uh, we can show we can show both. So I can I can show both. Okay. Once you start doing something on the screen, I'll make so sure you can see it. <laughs> yeah, so we can we can wait on the screen then if you, if you want. Yep. But once we do show the screen, I have a little outline of mm -hmm. what my role is at the firm. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're seeing it and now. And what's really cool is, okay, so this this is my role. But before I talk about that, I'll, I'll mention that we have a BIM manager as well, which is um, 
listed here. Basically, I coordinate uh, a lot of things with the BIM manager and the director of IT and our director of, of building performance. So I'll get to this in a minute, but uh, just wanted to plug our BIM manager, which is pretty awesome, uh, Stephen Campbell. He actually worked at Revit Technology Corporation before the Autodesk acquisition and then worked at Autodesk for 17 years after that. So he has a really deep knowledge of Revit and he and I uh, work really well together. It's a, it's a great team for the firm in, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, and then, so my role is sort of broken up into three buckets. That little cloud in the lower left is kind of describes where I spend my time. So like 40% of my time is on sustainability and building performance. Um, I'm not usually working on projects, but when, you know, any firm, when there's a need and something has to get done, right. um, you know, I'm, I'm jumping right. in and helping. So I did an embodied carbon study recently on a project and we're, we're doing all of our, um, wrapping up all of our reporting for the, the AIA uh, 2030 commitment, which mm -hmm. we've, we've been uh, members since the beginning and reporting our firm wide portfolio uh, for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So we're using, you know, Autodesk, Revit, and Insight to get our predictive EUIs for that. Uh, another 40% of my time is on uh, design technology. So whether it's IT related or um, BIM standards, you know, working with Stephen to figure out, you know, what we need to do to make things more sophisticated and, and more efficient. And some of that's Creating right now, we're looking at um, uh, basically getting more Enscape content. So we have we we you know we Enscape's doing a good job of creating more diverse content, but we want even more of that. So we're acquiring our own content, looking at possible options of making our own content. Um, and then another twenty percent of my time is is actually marketing and PR. So this. This would count as part of that twenty percent of that time. Wait, are you on the clock right now? Uh, presenting Is that what you're trying to yeah. tell me? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Awesome. awesome. I'm promoting the firm, the firm brand, and promoting I, our use of technology. I hope I hope I don't get an is, invoice from Mike awesome. Plato in a, in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I would totally pay it. I promise you. <laughs> you were saying this was sponsored. I, I was expecting a, a something from Buck Davis. So just kidding. Um, awesome. <laughs> So cool. So, so anyways, quick, it's a really cool, cool role. Yeah. Uh, real, real quick, uh, before we move on from it, because um, I know this isn't necessarily the topic of, of today's discussion, but um, the embodied, in, embodied carbon studies, um, are you using EC3 for that? Or are you using something different? I mean, what, what, what do you use for that? We're using uh, Tally by Karen Timberlake. Okay. Because uh, that, that may be a good topic of discussion for a future call because that's something that we've been we've been toying with yeah. quite a bit too, even on on the construction side, and and I've been sort of messing around with some of them. So I'm good, glad to know that that you've you've gone through the process. So I have someone I can reach out to when I'm like, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> but it could be a good yeah, con no, could a good conversation exactly. for this for this show because um, it's a great great um, uh, intersection of you know what it is that we're doing with BIM and and sustainability, and not to mention it's also it seems like. Uh, maybe there was a white paper or something, but it's like one of those things where all of a sudden owners are asking about it more. You know, it's like 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 when 4D came around, all these things. You know, all of a sudden it's like somebody sent out an email to all the owners and said, "Here's the buzzword for today. Let's put in RFPs type of thing." So, so I've been hearing I've been hearing the embodied carbon quite a bit lately, and and you know, and messing around with it. So that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, no, and we we we're doing quite a bit with it. Um, we designed and it's built now in Austin the first uh, boot, boutique uh, hotel in North America, that's Mass Timber. We're designing a data science center for the University of Pennsylvania. That's all Mass Timber. Mm -hmm. um, and we've done a lot of Mass Timber projects, but the cool thing about the Magdalena project is it's actually using DLT for, um, for the floor systems, mm -hmm. which doesn't use glue so the the fact that you take glue out of the equation and the sequestered, you know, the carbon sequest sequestering of the the DLT is just massive in terms of the difference of a mm. traditional steel or concrete structure. 
Wow. It's like 40% wow. improvement um, in the global, global warming potential. Nice. Awesome. So, so you came, you came, you come into this role, um, and you've obviously got tons of experience and background with with all of these aspects of, of what it is that you're doing now at Lake Flato. And I, I'm interested to to hear sort of, um, and obviously not trying to make you uh, uh, put you on the spot too much, but sort of interested on on your overall um, thoughts of of because in in you know when I work with these you know larger well known companies, I'm always interested to see how how well. Are they practicing what either they're preaching or we think they, they should be as far as some of these technologies? So maybe on the Revit and BIM front, and, and I'm super interested because uh, one of the biggest mis, misconceptions, I think, in, in the Revit world, and, and I'm sure there's people out there who think this right now on the, in the audience, is that Revit's not good for custom residential. For some reason, it's just <laughs> one of those things, and, and, and maybe it's because of the, the way it's been developed over time and marketed and used. But um, um, I'm curious to see because, you know, again, I know Lake Flato does a lot of different work, but, you know, I know them personally from a lot of the residential work, plus all the books you mentioned. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on sort of the use of BIM and Revit for this highly mm -hmm. custom residential. I mean, it is highly custom residential. Yeah, I've, I've heard that as well. And I totally beg to differ, especially <laughs> now having been here almost a year. Mm -hmm. all the, every project we do is in Revit, period. Um, and interestingly enough, we're architects and interior designers only. So mm -hmm. um, residential, it's true, but particularly true on commercial projects. We're always working with the best of the best mm -hmm. MEPs and structural consultants uh, for the project and the location of the project. Mm -hmm. uh, but on, on the Revit side for residential, you know, we're, we're using um, VR all the time and we're, you know, during the pandemic, we we've, we've bought a ton of Oculus Go and and now mm -hmm. that Yulio supports the Quest 2 we're Quest 2, buying Quest, two is, 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 Quest 2 is a great piece of technology uh, I have amazing. to say <laughs> I, I mean say. <laughs> so I don't know if we'll have time for it today but mm -hmm. the Quest 2 I've done three amazing things with it now so Yulio which is it's it just came out mm -hmm. with support for it um, with the the uh, link cable doing full endscape with it right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i'm on a special beta which i'm allowed to talk about and i need to write a post about this soon with nvidia on their cloud xr mm -hmm. with an instance of a workstation in amazon's aws server in oregon mm -hmm. two thousand miles away sending uh full endscape live vr to a wireless quest 2 headset wow so you're using oh. you're using the hardware from the the virtual machine and you're and you're seeing In the cloud the full, wow you're opening That's... up an nscape standalone exe mm -hmm. starting vr from that cloud instance that's two thousand miles away mm -hmm. has to be mm -hmm. under a hundred latency for this to work mm -hmm. um, at home i have wi-fi 6 but it'll also work on a, a good 5g network mm -hmm. Crazy cool, wow. um, and so, anyways, <laughs> that that sounds like something. Once you've laid it all out in your in your blog posts and 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 got it all in order, the procedure that definitely sounds like something that uh, would be super interesting to this audience. So, when you're ready to to share it with the world, let me know. because <laughs> yep. I'd be interested to see it too. Because that, of course, that's one of the limitations of of uh, something like the Quest is is unless you use the link you know, being untethered means you're you're using only the hardware that exists on that headset, which is obviously right. limited, right? You're not going to have and the, the magic with yeah. cloud XR is they have some special drivers they've developed around that, that I believe ties into the NVIDIA Omniverse mm -hmm. um, core. And it's basically streaming, you know, it's like, you know, uh, ID, RDP or, or VMware's blast technology optimized mm -hmm to send the, the graphics over the over the cloud it's it's amazing yeah. i can't believe how, how good of an experience it was it wasn't perfect but <clears throat> when you consider all of those those factors and how it's only going to get better mm -hmm. and, and you're wireless so, right i mean that's that's you know untethered yeah. untethered vr is sort of like the the, the holy grail right now right is truly, right. truly untethered vr so yeah that's awesome and so back back to just you know revit at lake plato um, you know, nobody's perfect and nobody does everything optimized all the time, but all, all projects are in Revit and practically every project 
is is using Enscape almost daily. Um, we're we're showing our clients the presentations, you know, mainly on the screen, but occasionally mm -hmm. in in VR headsets. Mm -hmm. Um, we recently, we've been developing some custom tools since I started. We're actually using Michael Kilkelly, who mm -hmm. I, you've had on the show, right? Yep. From Ar yep. Ar Ar Martyr. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's a developer and we've hired him to develop, develop a couple of custom add-ins for us. So not Dynamo scripts, mm -hmm. not Grasshopper, but just full-blown add-ins on our custom ribbon. And uh, just to answer your question about walking the walk a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so on this tab, there's shortcuts to our sustainability metrics and our BIM mm -hmm. standards, but then there's a, <clears throat> a uh, room finish tool that basically copies all the actual finishes in a room to the parameters for the wall finish and the floor finish that would show up in tags or in a room finish schedule. Mm -hmm. And I remember working with our interiors folks and, and some of the other people about on this. And I'm like, so are you sure you want to do this? Because not everybody always puts the finishes everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. and, you know, but the more we want to do VR and the more we want to do things more the BIM way, they, they push back and they're like, no, we, we have to do it this way. So <laughs> I was like, cool, that's great. That's awesome. That's what you want to hear, right? <laughs> oh. Exactly. Very cool. All right. So, so, and this is why I think it's a good transition. Um, you know, the, the fact that, that, uh, Enscape is being used, which is great because I've mentioned it numerous times on the show that, you know, I, not just as a visualization tool. Um, and I've, even in the past, I have mentioned some of the limitations I felt of Enscape as far as a full blown visualization tool. Um, uh, it's getting way less limited, uh, and we'll talk about some of those new features, but I've always said that, uh, as a design tool, it's phenomenal, right? Get, getting, getting mm -hmm. yourself, getting yourself into the perspective view quickly, being able to modify, seeing it and, and just seeing your design from a different perspective instead of that. 30,000 foot ortho box that we're all used to looking at in Revit is, is awesome. So with that being said, I think it's probably time we jump into some of the Enscape stuff. Um, so, yep. so, um, I, and, and for those of you not familiar or, or, or in with the news of the, of the day, um, Enscape 3.0 came out a month or two ago. I don't even know what it's been now. Um, and there was some huge changes. Um, we kind of teased them up on the last <laughs> episode, uh, Dan was on back in like October or something like that. Um, yeah. when we, when we talked about 2.9, and so now, now, now they're here, and uh, and they're pretty cool. So I'll just let you sort of run the show for a minute or two, and we'll ask questions. And obviously, guys, ask questions. But um, you know, I, I think in general, maybe we can just talk about some of the things that you'd like to highlight as far as this release and Enscape in general. And and of course, we can keep it along the lines of even uh, you know how you've seen it being used in like Plato too. And I'll probably ask some of those questions. But uh, um. Yeah, let's go, Dan. Go ahead. Everyone's seeing yeah. your screen, so uh, so they can cool. see you launched Enscape. Yeah, and so first thing I want to do is show you something that I didn't show since our last presentation. It, it's something that didn't quite work right out of the gate in 2.9 mm. in Revit, but then an update uh, adjusted it. Um, so this is a pre 3.0 and a sort of a post 2.9, and it has to do with how you can adjust the displacement maps mm. in mm. Revit. So it was working pretty well in SketchUp and, and some of the other tools. But um, here's the traditional, just the albedo texture. You know, it looks flat and still nice-ish looking. Mm -hmm. um, you can add a, a bump map and, and make it have a little bit more depth to it. You can actually add a normal map as well and, and give it a little bit more definition. Mm -hmm. But now with the displacement map, you have this absolutely beautiful thing of being able, being able to see the top side of that piece of stone and the bottom side of that piece of stone. And it self shades, of course, if you, mm -hmm. if you change the time of day. And so what, what makes that work? Yeah. I was gonna say, maybe quickly show folks how, how that, how that comes into play in the Revit yep. environment. Yeah, there's a specific trigger, if you will, that makes this work. And uh, on the appearance asset for the bump map, first of all, there's there's a height map. So if you're downloading these images uh, from an online source where they give you the normal, the bump, the height, uh, I'm actually, we're using the height map. 
And actually, Stephen set all this up for me. So thanks to him for <laughs> doing this. He did some internal training. And actually, I'm doing some training tomorrow myself internally on 3.0. So this is a good test run nice. for that. Nice. Uh, but on the bump Nothing map, like testing it live with uh, four, yeah. Yeah, 200 people. <laughs> right. So on the bump map, as soon as you hit 500, that triggers this special thing. If we just set that to 499 even, all of a sudden that whole hmm. uh, elegance of that bump map went away. Mm -hmm. And then it can be higher than 500. So if we do something, well, I'll call it crazy, 800 for this particular example. There we go. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. That's impressive, yeah. And of course, this is a perfectly flat image, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's not really 3D, mm -hmm. but it looks 3D and it self-shades. Mm -hmm. right? I could stand to adjust the true north here to make this a little bit better, but you can see the, <clears throat> the shadows. Uh, awesome. Another cool example is this wood paneling. Oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> so this is a perfectly flat image. Mm -hmm. And you can see how it's self-shading. So sc Scoured on YouTube had a great question about how does it handle the corner. So, I mean, I know that other one you have bumped at 800, but maybe if you if you rolled it back to something manageable and you made a corner, how does how does Revit slash Enscape handle that displacement? Yeah, so the, so the thing is, it's still, like I showed from the side view, it's still mm -hmm. literally flat. Mm -hmm. So there, you're not really going to see this wrap around the corner very mm -hmm. well. I mean, even if you painted that a separate material, maybe? Uh, no, maybe not. Well, I mean, yeah, right there, it, it feels like it's yeah, yeah. projecting. But if I do a section box on this and cut it through, it, it's a completely straight edge. Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. It's not really 3D. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just, yes. It looks 3D. Yeah. This, so, isn't, this isn't replacing modeling some of this stuff if you need to make details of it or something. Yeah. <laughs> but this can get you, uh, you know, so much more. Mm -hmm. depth, and of course, yeah, exactly. Character. And you wouldn't necessarily be doing it to this dramatic effect necessarily. I mean, I guess you could be depending on what your wall is. But, yeah, yeah. But uh, right. but the the benefits far away that that one limitation in my opinion. <laughs> totally. Um, and awesome. I guess one one last thing before I switch into the three stuff then is if we look at this file. Actually, I needed to right click and select open. That's what I wanted to do. And so for, for yeah, I was just yeah. going to say for people that are there, this is a height map, right? This is, yep. so this is uh, something that maybe some Revit users haven't necessarily explored too much. Right. Um, so this it, darker stuff mm -hmm. is projecting more than, than the, the lighter areas. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, um, and, and I think this is more of a con confirmation thing for, for me, but um, so if you're using a height map, unless you, if you don't go beyond the 500, um, it's not registering the bump correctly, right? So, so you, you, would, you kind of have to determine, are you going to use displacement or are you going to use a bump? And it has to be defined that way or else you will have a flat image. Is that, is that right. correct? Uh, this, yeah. this would still give some Some, bump. Rare, yeah. But not not the same as like a, a bump map would have where it has the right yeah yep. cool. exactly awesome all right so i'm gonna close this file because i just wanted to share that i think that's super cool myself so that the <laughs> one of the biggest things about enscape 3.0 is the user interface change hmm. which you know most of the time you hear a user interface change it's like oh boy great thanks <laughs> <laughs> no thanks yeah, but no, in this yeah. Case, i think it's amazing because a lot of the tools got moved to the Enscape window, which previously you had to always switch back to Revit, SketchUp, mm -hmm. Rhino, the, the design platform to trigger something that you just wanted to see back in Enscape mm -hmm. and had nothing to really do with the Revit model. So the tools that are left here in the Revit model, of course, are gonna be, um, let me close this, I thought I already closed that. So the tools that are here are going to be the things that you would interact with your model, like assets. You're going to 
use this tool to place assets in Revit. They're visualized later in, in the Enscape render window, placing a sound source, and then some of the settings that, that are just system settings. They're, those are all accessed still from the, the Enscape tab, but everything else has been moved into the Enscape window. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and start it up. And while it's starting, you can see they have a, a new logo. Yep, yep, the new logo. Sort of an abstract E version of, of the box that they, they used to have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now, the, that, now the, that they're, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the user interface is something that um, is definitely a welcome change. And, and I can tell, and anyone who's used it in any earlier versions will will be able to relate to the struggle of, opening window, popping window, closing window, overlapping, like how, especially if you tried to use it on one monitor, right. uh, the challenge of what it could be yeah. for sure. <laughs> so right off the bat, and I, like I mentioned, I've, I've written a uh, blog post for Enscape on their blog. And one of the posts is about making custom sky boxes. And I think we might've touched on this last time, but here's one at our office in San Antonio, mm -hmm. which about a block to the left here, literally a block away is the alamo which is pretty cool <laughs> just not in that photo unfortunately <laughs> no it's, yeah, it's 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 behind this building which is actually our wood shop which is pretty cool actually hmm. um so the very first thing that you'll notice is there's a toolbar across the bottom there's the help window that's open usually or previously the help area was across the bottom Mm -hmm. um, personally, I, I like this sort of full side panel rather than something poking up into the window. It always kind of bothers me. So just having a nice clean break between the view and the, and the help info. There, there's also a tab here, which is interesting. It, it's actually a contextual help tab. So depending on what mm -hmm. you're doing, um, so if I, I click on something, you'll see mm -hmm the help changed based on what it was mm -hmm. that I'm interacting with. Um, you click the X to close that. And also, if you're doing a presentation, you might just make that entire top bar disappear. So there's a little arrow to do that. So there's a few of these subtle little arrows that we'll see as we progress through this. Mm -hmm. um, the very first thing, I'm going to just kind of present this in a way that you might actually use the software okay. uh, rather than just trying to go through it systematically from left to right and top to bottom. Um, uh, so the before, first thing- Before you jump in, there was a yeah. question that uh, I don't want to run away from until we, just in case we don't go back to it. Bernarda asked, how, how did you get the background photo? Was it a panorama? And I think you mentioned it quickly and you showed it in the last one, but um, maybe just talk for a split second about how that how that sure. is. Sure, and definitely go to the Enscape blog and search mm -hmm. for custom skybox. And I'll but, post links to it for sure on the, on the yep, blog. But also. basically uh, any 360 camera. So mm -hmm. uh, previously I, I had a uh, uh, Ricoh Theta S and, and uh, a, a GoPro Fusion, I think it was called at my previous company. Mm -hmm. uh, at Lake Plato, we have an Inst Insta... 360R, I believe. Mm -hmm. So basically it's a camera with two 180 degree lens. You put it on a tripod. You can pair an app on your phone with the device. And if you can go hide around the corner um, and take a picture. Otherwise you take two pictures with you standing in two spots and just erase yourself in Photoshop. <laughs> um, so really simple. Um, to do, and we do this on a, on a number of projects. So anyways, the, the first thing then that we wanna do here is like reset everything to, to no skybox, no depth of field, right? So mm -hmm. the way to do that is to go into the visual settings, which is in the upper right. So the upper left are all things to like export and interact with the model. The upper right are all settings that change how the view looks. That That's sort of how I've rationalized the two groupings. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if that's the official way to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you open this dialogue that's been pretty, pretty, uh, it's changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Like there's its own, their own, there's a skybox tab now, which is nice. Um, but 
the one thing that's sort of subtle is here's one of those little arrows on the side that you can expand. And this is an area where you can save a bunch of named presets, which we'll actually do in a little bit. But there's always going to be this custom preset. This is essentially the default. It's like printing in Revit or AutoCAD. There's always sort of the, the current settings option. That's not a named export option. So we're going to right click on that and select reset to default. And that just reset everything on all the tabs to what's considered the default. And that got rid of the, the background, mm -hmm. set the skybox to white ground. So right away I can make a few changes, uh, set it to ultra if I want. And then I'll close this and then go into the model. Um, uh, same thing as previous, I actually am using the Revit sample model that you can download from Enscape. So if any of you want to try this, they have this Revit model and all the textures so that you can get in here and, and mess around with this. And I'll make sure um, to link, link to those free, those free sample files too, because they've got a lot of great, great sample files. And so one thing that a, a person might do as they're navigating Enscape is, is they find a spot where they want to save this back to Revit so that they can get back to a specific view. So one of the challenges in, in Enscape has often been you, you find this spot, you just hit render and then move on. And then the design <laughs> tweaks and you really love that vantage point or your supervisor or boss or whoever you're working for maybe <laughs> loves it and you have to get back to it exactly. So uh, Enscape's always had this ability to save the current view back as a Revit view, but there's a handful of things now that, that we can do. And some of them have been there before, but they're a little bit more intuitive. So I'm gonna go through that process. Mm -hmm. So over here in 3D views, you can see the one we're about to create will get created there or, or will show up there. So there's this little binoculars icon called view management. And these are all the views that are already in the Revit model. We can actually star views or edit these views, which I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but I can also create a new view with this button down at the bottom. And I'm going to just call this Open Enscape Open Office. And uh, this this allows us then to link a visual preset to that view. So not only can we save this view, but we can also save all the settings associated with this view. Like maybe there's a different skybox and actually that'd be preferable in a lot of cases to have mm -hmm. different skyboxes depending on where you are in the building. Right. Um, like, you know, if you're in an 18 story view looking out the window, it's gonna be totally different than looking out the window down at the first floor. Mm -hmm. um, so to do that, we're going to go back over to the visual settings and I'm going to create a new preset and there's a couple of ways of doing this. You might just create some, um, some that just are generic, like light view, white mode. And so that way you can, you know, really quickly switch between these. Mm -hmm. But another option then might be uh, just matching the same name as the view. And then whatever I set here, this is going to be ultra for the skybox. I'm just going to pick a different one. And maybe I'll even bump up the outline. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that that's all saved. I just switched to another one and switched back just to see that the settings I've had some problems. There's not a, like an apply button here. So, so you just had some it, problems it changes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's sticking. So I'm going to close that. And then over here, here are all those options that I just created, including the one that matches the view name. So I hit save and I should have pointed out actually while I was in this edit mode and that's how you get back is here's where you can star that view. If you want it to show up 
in the standalone EXE as a curated view for the experience and also in VR. Um, you just star the views and just those starred views, not the exhaustive list of 150 3D views from your project, right? Show up in, in mm -hmm. Enscape or in VR. Mm -hmm. um, so then if we were to just completely close this and we're on the 3D view here, so I start Enscape. And I probably should have picked a different view because the skybox will probably be the default. Mm. Seeing as this this didn't have a linked view. Mm -hmm. This this 3D view. Mm -hmm. In Enscape, and, and it's some of this has been possible recently, but not as intuitive, I, I would say, as how you create the view and then link the visual presets. Yeah. So now I can click on this and switch. And if I go to this view. Mm -hmm and then manually reset. And then click on this again. You can see how the sky box changed. Mm -hmm. The lines showed up. And then the, the last piece to really getting to a repeatable rendering. I mean, there's there's still more that, that could be done to help with this, but mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. turning on the safe frame, this used to be uh, sort of more of a hidden setting. Right. And this is something I use like when I'm creating the renderings for my books, they have a vertical orientation mm -hmm. and a really high resolution. Um, when you, when you don't have this on, it just fills the frame and you find, find yourself trying to like adjust it like this to make it the right proportions. But, mm -hmm. um, this helps you, uh, compose the scene for whatever the current export resolution is, mm -hmm. which right now is 1920 by 1080. Awesome. Yeah, the the view view management in general, um, you know, seeing that they're they're working on it is, is super helpful because anyone who has again tried to to manage and re-render and do all of this, you can see the benefits. I will say that one one limitation that still sort of exists, but this is helping with, is um, working with design options or specific visual setups on the Revit side. Um, and, you, and if you're trying to batch those renderings, so anyone who's dealing with that um, knows that um, it can be a little bit of a challenge uh, as to what what design option you're seeing and what view, what view, because this still this is all the Enscape side. It's not necessarily pulling from you know the Revit side. So, um, but but being able to create those views now and have those views maybe dedicated and so on is 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 helpful for sure. <laughs> and yeah. The, and the yeah. UI is very helpful because. Um, you know, in the last three versions, you know, creating a saved view was um, not a very intuitive thing, I think, for most people uh, from, mm -hmm. from Enscape. Like you mentioned, you would just kind of render it and then be like, oh, crap, I got to render it again and go back and try and sort of get close to the same image if you didn't save the view type of thing. <laughs> yep. Same image, yeah. same vantage point, same settings. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, what else? Um, so there's the view management and the view settings, those those two work pretty closely together. Uh, there's the ability to just render a, an image to a file that's called a screenshot. There's for Revit, seeing as this is unique to Revit, this command still back in the Revit interface, mm -hmm. the render the image into the project manager or the project browser. Mm -hmm. um, there's video editor, which I'm gonna get to in a minute, the panoramas. So mono and stereo, um, and I should, this, why not? Now's a good time to, this is public on Enscape's uh, user forum, their roadmap for 3.1. And there's uh, one thing I wanna mention that's pretty cool is this panorama gallery, this idea of connecting panoramas, which is similar to what Yulio does. I don't know how much of that space they're gonna try and compete with. I actually honestly don't know, even though mm -hmm. I have a, a lot of deep connections there. Mm -hmm. um, simplified assets. Uh, Steven and I are actually playing around with this ourselves right now. Unfortunately, you can't really modify Enscape's content very much. Um, there are some tweaks you can do, but to make them all white or all black right. or, or sort of a orangish gold color, um, I believe that's what what they're doing here, which is would be a full another set of geometry, not just a toggle, mm -hmm. from what I understand. And then the big one, probably for all Revit users, is a, a 
the Enscape material editor for Revit. Mm. So everything that Revit can do now will probably just be mappings in, you know, it'd be bi-directional, I'm guessing. Right, uh, but right. there's some things you can do in, in, in SketchUp that you can't do in Revit right now. Like mm -hmm. um, I know SketchUp has a slider for the grass height in, in Revit. You have short grass, tall grass. <laughs> yeah, if, if I'll post the links to, to your previous episodes. But yeah, we talked about that quite a bit is, is um, yeah, the only way to get grass is to name it a certain way. And then, and then that's how you get it. So uh, right. it, I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see how they... Um, you know, detach but still connect to the Revit material uh, editor. I think it's a good thing in general. Um, the only downfall I personally think about it is whenever I'm teaching people Enscape, it's kind of like, um, hey, you know how to render in Revit? Well, that's what you do. You set up your model to render in native Revit, and then Enscape works. Now it may be a little bit different because you're going to have an, another material editor on top. But yeah, the functionality, yeah, the functionality and the and the and the you know the ability or the the adaptability of it you know, is going to be. It's, probably, it's definitely going to produce better output downstream. Yeah, and I think the <laughs> average user or maybe even just, let's call it the average application, could still just use the current workflow. And mm -hmm. if you want to go beyond, that's when you'd open the Enscape mm -hmm. material editor. Um, and then they're curating what it looks like. They're a list of high-quality materials that, that you can use and, and tweak from there, which I'm understanding to be brick and wood and carpets and things like that. Awesome. So somebody actually asked, and I know, I think you, it sounds like you were going to jump into the new video editor, but yep. maybe because somebody did ask, uh, Bernarda asked about custom assets. Um, I don't know if maybe, I, were you planning on touching on that? So yeah, maybe... actually, I, I know we're, so are we going to be able to go past 1230 a little bit or are we yeah, going yeah, to try to do Definitely. Stop? Okay. definitely. As, actually, I have a, um, what's cool, like I mentioned, is there is a way of making custom assets. And I have a 3D scan of myself. And one, one I'm going to show you how to make from an OGB, OGB file hmm. uh, of Mortz, one of the founders of Enscape. I actually <laughs> nice. was texting back and forth with him this morning. Okay, if I use this in the presentation, <laughs> he carefully answered, yes, it's okay for that application <laughs> awesome so so then so, if you want to go in the order you're going in i just want to yeah, let bernardo yeah, know show, that 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 you will touch on custom assets so so yep, stick around <laughs> yep i'm gonna show the video editor next sure and, and really so after the ui and just kind of getting the lay of the land and and the um creating views and linking the visual settings mm -hmm. after that it's just figuring out where the existing stuff is that's mm -hmm. always been in there Right. <laughs> um, but the next, the, the last big thing that's different is, is just how to create a, a video path. Mm -hmm. So now you can hit the letter V. It used to be K. So V is to toggle into the video editor mode. And then K is just for creating keyframes. And I'm going to do a, a quick generic one. And then I'm going to come back and, and do something a little different, a little bit more sophisticated so i'm going to hit k and and part of the new interface then is this timeline across the bottom so this little half diamond is my first keyframe and i'm going to move forward and you can see i'm you know i'm, I'm actually using my 3d connection mouse which is this little guy mm -hmm. uh, but even if you were doing the w with your left mouse button it's still pretty hard to keep it perfectly straight and I'm going to show a trick about that in a little bit, actually, that I, Phil Reed uh, clued me in on recently. So I'm going to hit K. And let's say I wanted to have a pause here. I can hit K again. And then I'm going to keep moving forward. And I'm going to hit K one more time. So here are the two keyframes mm -hmm. right on top of each other. You can see when I hover over it, it says keyframes two and three occupy the same point in time, mm -hmm. which is really cool. So I can basically set up a pause there. I've done a blog post on how to do this by exporting the XML file and hacking that and then re-importing <laughs> it. Right. But now right. this makes it easier. So if I click on one of these diamonds or half diamonds, it jumps me into that keyframe. And I'm gonna just, all I'm gonna do right now is get right back out of it just to show you how. There's 
a little exit keyframe icon here. So when I click on that, I'm not in a keyframe, mm -hmm. but I'm in just the, the video editor where I right. can add new keyframes or even sort of step aside and, and look at the path. Mm -hmm. But once you kick, click on a keyframe down here, it puts you into that keyframe and now you can't see the path. Like the path is hidden because mm -hmm. it's showing you what the view would be from that keyframe. And it tells me I'm on keyframe one of four. Mm -hmm. So if I do the, the next keyframe, it moved me to two of four. So now I know I'm on, uh, on this one that otherwise would be kind of hard to pick because they're stacked mm -hmm. on top of each other. And I can do a timestamp and say, I want this one. I want it to take six seconds to get there. And then I'm going to hit update. So you don't always have to hit update. It mm -hmm. seems to stick, you know, when you click next or whatever, but that's what the button's for. So yeah. I'm trying to show it the right way. <laughs> and then I go to the next keyframe, which is three or four. Again, it's right on top of, of two. I'm going to do a timestamp. And and for me, there's some something a little glitchy in the UI here. I don't know if it's just my graphics card, <laughs> but I have to click really quick to, to get it to, to jump to that. Mm -hmm. um, so now I'm going to click back on the first keyframe and then hit the play button here in the lower left. And I go and it stops for the four or five, six seconds or whatever I picked. And then it'll start up again. Nice. And there's lots of things you can do to mm -hmm. like do another one and make it look to the right and, and lots of little delicate things like that. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to share that's really cool is that um, well? Let's see. Actually, before I do that, so I'm gonna I'm gonna exit. I'll, I'll do a little bit more with this really simple one. So one thing that was pretty much impossible to do before was to add a keyframe past the end or before the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, what you've always been able to do is click along this path and and have a keyframe added wherever you click. Um, but now, if I wanted to start uh, down this hallway. So I'm going to just move myself down here. And then what I normally do is hit the space bar just to make sure I'm stuck to the ground. Right. Now I can click this little plus at the beginning of the timeline. Mm. And that did something that again, <laughs> never really possible before to add a keyframe before, before the beginning. Oh, yes. <laughs> or at, at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, yet another way of adding a keyframe, which is a little bit confusing. I mean, once you've done it twice and done it wrong twice, you'll, you'll know how, to, how it works. But um, so you, like I said, you can always click on the path, which is going to put another keyframe explicitly on that path. Mm -hmm. But right now I'm between, um, so there's the first one that I just, there's the first one I just added, the original first one, the second one, and, and now there's actually a space, interestingly enough, between those two that were on top of each other. And notice how there's a plus between those two keyframes. So when I first saw this, just instinctively, I thought clicking there would just put one on the path, like right between those two, because that's mm. really where the plus shows up. Right. But what it does is it adds a keyframe where the camera currently is. In between the two. In between those two. Neat. So now if I, again, step out, I've just sort of shifted that off to the side a little bit. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Although that, that did something <laughs> weird. Oh, I must have clicked. I must have clicked in the wrong spot, right? Yeah, so, you're between the paws. That's okay. <laughs> one, two, three. So I'll yeah, click yeah. on that. Now, this is a good way of showing how to delete a keyframe. So I'm going to click on that one to get in it. And then over here, number four of six, I'm going to hit the little trash icon. And I'm going to delete the selected keyframe. So that that's almost the, the the entire works. You can see the override still here mm -hmm. on the screen. So this one has a time override. And if I were to click on this, um, I could also change the focal point or the field of view. Uh, another thing that's kind of weird, I'm just making sure everybody knows all the ins and outs. So notice how all the field of view for all of these is 90, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say on this one, I want to change this to something less than 90, just something really big, big change. Well, for
for some reason it decided to i guess supply that everywhere <laughs> see that yeah it doesn't transition so what you would um and may i suppose depending on how you look at it that's that's by design we didn't explicitly tell it you know mm -hmm. that it should be something else although it implied that it was something yeah, else yeah. so so what you'd need to do is the frame before check this and stick mm -hmm. it to 90 right mm -hmm. and now so 84 84 84 and mm -hmm. then it jumps down to 41 mm -hmm. so hmm. and then you'll see the field of view change right here A little hard to tell because it looks like it's just it could be moving yeah. forward or it could be zooming <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's great that that and again i think um to people new to enscape this would be like great this is nice easy to use anyone who's used the old video editor um will know how much uh, easier this ux and ui is because it really yeah. not to say that because the function a lot of the functionality was there kind of but it was really yeah. the order of operations and understanding how you know how how to do like even like you said the keyframe before and, and the modifying after the fact it was it, it was challenging i will i would yeah. and so so this is definitely and having the whole timeline on the bottom having the plus and plus on each end i mean these things are they're simple but um so for those of you who are new to enscape congratulations you don't have to deal with the old version <laughs> I know, right? uh, and those of you who are, are have used enscape i hopefully you see the the value in this um, one thing that somebody asked which um joe asked about um the license setup and if we can explain it um i will say joe just real quickly the enscape folks are extremely accessible and and i'm sure if you have any <laughs> license questions they will they will definitely respond and 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 but i will tell you that there's as far as i know there's only two licenses it's floating and 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 standalone and so the only yeah. differences between the two is that floating you can install on as many computers as you want but you can only use it one person at a time standalone you can only install on one machine and it's sort of dedicated to that user slash machine so yeah. otherwise i'm pretty sure there's the only two licenses right i don't think there's anything I think else. so yeah and then the, the the shared network license is cool because enscape manages that in the mm -hmm. cloud mm -hmm. so if you're if you're on a laptop in the office or, or at home mm -hmm. or even on your personal device if your company allows it you could install that or apply the network key mm -hmm access that pool of license and yeah super if you're if you're dealing with any more than one person it's definitely worth it um you know we so, so an example is we we have my my team itself we have about six of us um and just based on the amount of usage we have we have two floating licenses and and it works great i mean we all have it installed and we you know so at any moment in time two out of the six can use enscape um, if we needed more we would just add another user to it but right now only once in a while we'll step on each other's toes just based on what we do but um, I think that's the only two license types they have. But again, feel free to reach out to those guys. They're they're yeah. extremely uh, uh, easy to get in touch with, and they will definitely answer any licensing questions you guys have. <laughs> All right. So there's just a couple last things about videos. Um, mm -hmm. On the timeline, there's these little dots that really just help you. Like if I exit this keyframe again, um, you know, there's always been this this little graphic that shows you that there's overrides but you can't see all the graphics on the whole path. So down here, you can see where things have been modified and you can't really click on those or do anything with those directly other than clicking mm -hmm. the keyframe, which then allows you to mo modify that. Um, and then when you exit the keyframe again, these overall, like the, the video proper settings become available, like the overall duration, ease in, ease out. Um, here's where you can save this path to a file and um and then also load new paths or i just want to start over i'm going to click that and, and say yes and it just wiped the slate clean mm -hmm. um, the very last thing I was, I was mentioning about you know trying to keep keep a straight path and you know mm -hmm. go straight mm -hmm. down the hallway and and not be looking up and down there's a, a really cool feature again something that's actually been there but you can enable uh, let me go to the plan view first. You can enable the Revit camera in the Enscape camera in Revit. So this is actually a live version of what you're looking at in Enscape. If I if I select this and move it, it just mm. adjusted what you're looking at. So what this means 
is first of all, I could rotate that to be perfectly Perfect. straight. <laughs> Notice the properties. I can adjust the pitch to be perfectly zero. And then back here, I hit K. I grab this thing and I could use the move command to be very careful about moving it perfectly straight. You know, I always wondered what could I do with, with the camera? Because I, I, I've known that existed, but I didn't think yeah. of how to use it. But that's perfect. Perfectly makes sense. If you want, if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, is it yeah. rocking up and down? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So that was under general settings for everyone who, who might have missed how we got to that. Um, under In your Revit ribbon of Enscape, under general settings, you can turn on the live Revit camera, which yep. shows your Enscape camera as a live object in Revit. Super cool. Which, yeah, which is a family that has those parameters associated with it mm -hmm. that Enscape is tracking. Yep, There's even, even like even like rotating without looking up type of thing, right? If you're standing still and you want to do a, a panoramic shot of a view, of a view, you know, if you're just using your mouse and keyboard, you're still slightly looking up and down as, as you're turning. Yep. So, so that's, exactly. that's awesome, yeah. So here's a, another thing in here for performance. <clears throat> you have a lesser powered card, you can turn off grass and mm. um, you can turn on rest mode. I can't remember which way it is. Uh, one, one of these makes the wind in the video keep playing, mm. even when you've stopped mm -hmm. and the water waving. One of these freezes all that so that it's not mm -hmm. using too many resources. And then if you have an NVIDIA RTX enabled car, you definitely want this on because I've done a lot of ROI testing and this can make a, a good 10% difference in performance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you turn it off, it's usually more for a performance thing. Mm -hmm. So last thing we should probably get to is the um, custom content. Yes, for Sound sure. Good? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, let's wrap it up with custom content. I so like <laughs> there's actually a settings file that here's the example of one we actually push out with a script to every, everybody's computer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we can have all of our content. Everybody's looking at an offline location <laughs> for the content mm -hmm. so that it is all absolutely instantaneous. There's no waiting for an hour for the mm -hmm. content to refresh. <laughs> and then there's also a place to define where our custom content lives. And this is just a few examples. We, we have quite a bit now that we've been curating. Here's, here's a version of me. And as I mentioned, I'm going to make one of Moritz, the, one of the co-founders of Enscape. <laughs> and the place you actually start is you buy the content, whether it's from TurboSquid or Render People, and you get an OBJ file and some material files. And the problem we're going to see with this is this is like, and, and this is a custom scanned one, just like the one I have of me that um, was originally scanned for me by CTC software mm -hmm. um, in Minneapolis. Uh, it has 90,000 polygons, which is way too many for one person. So uh, first place I'm going to do, first thing I'm going to do is go into Blender and uh, reduce the poly count. This, this only takes a couple of minutes. So Blender is free. So you can go like just recently we bought a couple of models of, of some kids and they were like 40, 44 dollars each on render people. Mm -hmm. And so you bring these people in the OBJ file. I'm just going to move this uh, near the origin real quick. And then there's a, a decimate tool in here that mm -hmm. will allow us to reduce the, the poly count. Um, we also have to make make him a little shorter because um, actually each one of these is uh, a meter. So two is like tall. 12 feet tall right now, <laughs> I think. So are you, why, why are you reducing the poly count? Is that for performance or for low? Yeah, absolutely for performance. Mm -hmm. um, Enscape will actually throw up a warning in its custom editor. If you try and generate something that has more than 20,000 polys, mm -hmm. uh, just because 
you know, it's a real time rendering engine. Mm -hmm. It's not a uh, static ray trace where you're willing to wait three days for the, the, right, <laughs> the right. most amazing rendering <laughs> ever, which, you know, to be fair is, is needed in some cases, but not, not in this case. So, um, we're going to use this modifier to, um, decimate down to like, and see how it says 90,000 for mm -hmm. the face count. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to make this something like 0.2. So like any good cooking show, I've already sort of worked, worked out what the number should be, right? Yeah. Um, and then I'm also going to copy and duplicate this because I'm going to make the, the placeholder geometry that's going to live in the Revit family as well. Hmm. So I'm going to hide hide the highly detailed one and make one that's uh, 900. Okay. And you can see it's it's mm -hmm. and actually we can triangulate it. So now we have two options here. I'm going to select this one, and I'm going to export this. I'm going fast because people can watch this in slow mo later, right? Yeah, yeah. And and I think in general, I think the 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 process is more important than the tool. Um, yeah. You're using Blender. It's open source, free, great tool. But you can do you can do these things in other 3D programs that people may be more comfortable with, as far as decimating yeah. messages and stuff like that. Yep. So yep. I you think, can I, use I, Max I, yeah, I think the key I here know. is that you're making, you know, a, a lower poly than what you downloaded for Enscape. So there's there's a limitation there. And then for what you see in Revit, you know, showing 32,000 polys is also not going to look all that great in Revit. So then you're making one that's um, reduced for Revit. So that's the key, I think, to the process here is if you download, uh, uh, I don't know, a uh, uh, operations table from TurboSquid that, you know, has, you know, 120,000 polys, you know, you may want to reduce it a little to make it represent or even work in the Enscape <laughs> asset editor. <laughs> so in, in the Enscape asset library, I clicked on the custom assets tab, and then I clicked this plus icon, which opened up this custom asset editor. Mm -hmm. And so I'm gonna go to import geometry. And here's the, the big one, 1. 1.5 megabytes. Mm -hmm. And you can see it show up here. You can double check the scale the texture automatically came in. You can actually adjust this if you wanted to back off on the intensity of the color. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and here's where you load the placeholder geometry. So this is the lighter weight version that shows up in the family. Awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then here you click this command if you want it to be more like close up. You could zoom in like that rather than have full body and hit generate thumbnail. So the next thing I have to do is just save this project and it defaults to, to where your custom stuff is that, that's defined here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then you're going to click generate asset. And that's it. That's it. <laughs> so now here is Mart's. <clears throat> and um, if I click that, and place him over here. He should show up. And as most of you know, <clears throat> most of this content is uh, the Enscape content comes in as um, <clears throat> uh, planting category, right? Mm -hmm. But it actually doesn't have to be. So if we go back to insert load family, so if I just pick some random round table from the Autodesk library, <clears throat> I place that in the model. We'll see it show up here. Make everybody dizzy. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Revit family. But if we go to the Enscape content, and, and actually, if we look at this family real quick, notice in the type properties, there's no Enscape parameters here. 
So if we go over to the Enscape provided content and search for table, Uh, weird. It's it's there. I saw one there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's, it must have a different name, a weird name. Yeah. So here's here's something closest, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe this one. There's a little button here to link this asset to a specific family and so table and then right away we'll see that table change so you can have any normal revit family in any category including furniture and you don't even need to use that workflow because these are not shared parameters you just need to make these parameters and plug in this information with any out of the box cust any out of the box Enscape content mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. custom content you made. The the main piece is going to be the cryptic code here, mm -hmm. and and then the height of of the thing. Um, and then one last thing that's also kind of cool: people occasionally have problems placing stuff in in Enscape, like mm -hmm. in Revit, like it always goes to the floor. Um, there's actually a little button here to place on surface. Mm -hmm. So this allows you to pick a surface and then place that nice little vegetable garden <laughs> or whatever that was. And by the way, the coolest thing ever in Texas is growing vegetables in January to be in this. This was my first winter here. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't have to place this on the floor and then move it up. Hmm. This person's afternoon snack, which <laughs> not too different than there you mine, go. <laughs> <laughs> is is on the right surface. So awesome, lots of fun stuff. So cool, yeah. Those 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 are the things that really got me excited on two point nine and three point oh. Is the linking the linking of assets is really huge. So for those of you, just to reiterate what what happened there is, you can place a Revit family. So if you have your model already done, or or you don't want to. You don't want to show the Enscape asset in your in your file. You can click a Revit family and say, when you launch Enscape, it's actually going to be this Enscape asset. So, you're actually not you're not um, compromising on your documentation, so to speak, for the sake of creating the Enscape asset, which is super cool. And then, of course, being able to bring in custom assets is part of you know uh, was a huge want for years with Enscape. Um, being able to build a larger library of stuff that you need and want is is massive and. Um, thanks for the tips uh, of the polygons is huge, right? So so reducing yep. the polygons. Um, the place on surface is awesome. Um, that's something that anyone who's ever used Enscape in the past, um, placing it on the floor and then having to go to a section view and then move it up to sit on a table is an absolute pain in the butt when you're trying to place a whole bunch of things. So that's a really cool tip. One, one last tip I got to mention. Sure. So off, offline is super helpful mm. and I highly recommend it. Yes. And having custom assets, of course, is super helpful and I highly re recommend it. But both of them do have uh, a challenge that's introduced into the workflow. And we run into this about once a week, it seems like, where somebody's opening... Uh, Enscape and they get an asset error because mm. their computer somehow didn't get the offline push mm. or and, and then that means they might have loaded some new content that we haven't downloaded yet mm -hmm. yeah, or they somebody on the team has used the, the version of me and, and they're using Revit at home or offline mm -hmm. and they don't have access to that cryptic code mm -hmm. you know mapping mm -hmm. to that uh, version of me so then you get an error when you're opening Enscape. it still opens but yeah. those families then or those those assets don't show up that's a good tip yeah i mean the the fact that now you're you're dealing with even if it's the Enscape library but or your custom library now you're dealing with with um you know local local um information uh and local loca file locations local file names all that stuff right you, you are adding a level of management there right just like a custom texture file would be or something like that right you, you need to you need to be able to to have a some sort of a plan for how you're going to manage and share those things throughout the office so yeah tip, here's tip. i have it on my c drive just for this presentation but there's a couple of gigs of you know all of the enscape mm -hmm. content and one of the reasons a lot of this is encrypted they they've a lot of this has been um, licensed through other other people so 
they, they can't just let us change it. Like right. you can see this right. one's from 3D people in the mm -hmm. lower right there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Man, awesome, Dan. Well, <clears throat> this is great. Uh, I think I think everyone, based on the questions and comments, uh, um, everyone seemed to enjoy this, so I appreciate it. Um, thanks for giving us a rundown of Enscape 3.0. Um, I'm definitely excited about it. I've been pretty pretty happy using it so far, so <laughs> it's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see some of the you know the custom assets and where people take those things with the interaction of Revit, which is always really really cool. Any any final words before we wrap up on uh, generally speaking or anything? <laughs> No, not not I can not that I can think of. I, awesome. I've, I'm sure. I'm sure. Talking, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure you'll be on the show again. And so I appreciate you coming on right now. Um, I always appreciate yeah. it. You always gave some great insight, and there's always one or two great gems within it. So uh, thanks for sharing. I really do appreciate it. Um, thank you to everyone here who's live with us today, um, and then whoever watches this replay in the future, feel free to reach out to myself or Dan. Uh, where can people find you, Dan? What's the best uh, best route to, to contact you? Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. Awesome. Uh, you search for my oh, name, you'll, great. you'll find me there. Yep, and I will make sure to put links to all those locations in the description to the video here on YouTube, but also on the blog post at therevitkid.com tomorrow. So, Dan, man, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for chatting, as always. Um, those of you live, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. If you haven't done so so far, make sure you subscribe to the channel here on YouTube um, and hit the notification bell um, as you will um, be notified when we go live again. Um, we actually rolled over 40,000 subscribers uh, a week or two ago, That's which awesome. is pretty cool, pretty cool. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Um, have a great week. Have a great weekend. And uh, with that, I want to bid you all adieu. Thank you and talk to you guys soon.